We have learned a lot from Block HF, and this is, of course, showing a significant clinical benefit of biventricular pacing over RV pacing. But now in the May 10th issue of Jack, a report of important ancillary data from Block HF, and this is improvement in clinical outcomes with biventricular versus right ventricular pacing. And I would like to introduce you to Ann B. Curtis, MD, who is from the University of Buffalo, a distinguished professor and chair of the Department of Medicine there and president and CEO of UBMD Internal Medicine. Let's go back a little bit because we have learned a lot from Block HF. Just remind us the high points before we get to your paper. Well, the reason we did the Block HF study had to do with the fact that uh, we know that patients who have pacing in the right ventricle for, uh, on, on a high percentage basis don't have very good outcomes. And so the point of the study was to look at biventricular pacing versus right ventricular pacing in patients whom, in whom we predicted that they would have a high percentage of ventricular pacing, such as with complete AV block or advanced first, second degree AV block, and some degree of left ventricular dysfunction uh, defined as an ejection fraction of 50% or less. The main outcome in the, in the study, uh, the main endpoint was uh, mortality, a heart failure related urgent care, and 15% uh, or greater change in LV and systolic volume index. In that composite primary endpoint, uh, we found that uh, the outcomes were much better in the biventricular pacing arm compared to the right ventricular pacing arm. So, so what are you reporting in this new paper in Jack? So uh, what we also did in the, main st in the study was to look at clinical outcomes as well, and we did that as a separate analysis. So when we were talking about clinical outcomes, we were looking at things like New York Heart Association class, quality of life, and the clinical composite score. That includes things like heart failure admissions and deteriorate quality of life and that sort of thing. Well, in the accompanying editorial comment, the authors note to describe these improvements, the investigators wisely chose the clinical composite score proposed by Milton Packer. Right. So this is obviously, uh, you, you're covering a lot of areas, I think, what, he's, what they're referring to in this right. in terms of what your, your choice of, of things to analyze. Right. It was, it was a broad-based look at uh, outcomes that would be clinically relevant to patients uh, in terms of the way they feel, uh, in their exercise tolerance, uh, staying out of the hospital is always important. But not necessarily what you get in many clinical trials. Correct, right. Yeah. So we, we did collect that on a prospective basis. And the good news is that for the clinical composite score, we found a significant benefit or improvement in patients with biventricular pacing over right ventricular pacing throughout uh, two years of follow-up. So, so all these important months. quality measures for patients, they were better with biventricular pacing? Correct, correct. That shouldn't be a surprise, but somehow it kind of is. I mean, in terms of just, you wouldn't necessarily think that the patients would feel better uh, for something that is just, it's helping their heart. Well, it goes hand in hand. I mean, when patients have better heart function, they do tend to feel better. Uh, it can be a challenge to try to tease that out, but... Uh, right ventricular pacing works for a lot of people, but it, like you said, it it's over time, it, over then you time, have a problem. It, it does, it can create a problem, right. And so we also found that quality of life was better at least through the first year, uh, and that New York Heart Association class was better at, at 12 months. Uh, and I, I think the, one of the other things I should point out with this is that we found these significant differences even though there was a fairly significant crossover rate uh, from right ventricular pacing to biventricular pacing. And that comes about when patients aren't feeling well and then their docs go and switch over to the other arm. So what that would tend to do is to dilute the difference between the two groups. And yet we found that significant difference in the clinical composite score. What do we still not know? in terms of biventricular pacing at this point? Well, I, I think it would be uh, important if we could figure out which patients are most likely to have that deterioration in function over time, because some patients actually do reasonably well. Uh, I think what we've learned from Block HF is that if there is LV dysfunction, that uh, you should favor biventricular pacing. But as I said, we still don't know if, if there's any way ahead of time to kind of tease that out and say, this group's likely to benefit to a large extent and another group maybe not so much. So as long as we don't have that answer, I think the, uh, the right thing to do is biventricular pacing in the patients who don't have good ventricular function. Are we going to learn anything else from Block HF? 
Well, I hope so. Uh, we're always trying to look at uh, what else other data we've looked at, and uh, we do have echo data that we've looked at, uh, and so a few other uh, areas like that, we're still looking at the data that we have. And the uh, main paper and the accompanying editorial is in the May 10th issue of Jack. Please check that out. For Cardio Source World News, I'm Executive Editor Rick McGuire.